Obviously, at this point, uh, we have sort of two wars going on, the Ukraine war and now a new war in the Middle East. Um, it seems like the Russia, U the Russia Ukraine thing was like the biggest thing ever, just like pounding us uh, nonstop through legacy media. And then all of a sudden it shifted uh, into this other war. Is that a signal that uh, appetite from the public is waning? Or do you think there's also a shift from the government on the Russia Ukraine old war, I guess? Well, I think there are two, uh, two things. Uh, the Ukrainian government and the proxy force that we built in Ukraine to attack Russia has lost. Ukraine is in ruins. The Ukrainian nation is essentially destroyed. Uh, we don't know how many people have died in the war, but somewhere is between 450 and 500,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. Large numbers wounded who will never return to active duty. Right now, there are talks going on in a place called Avdika. I always have difficulty pronouncing it. It's a town in eastern Ukraine beyond the Dnieper River, where there are thousands of Ukrainian troops facing a Russian force. And there are discussions there about a mass surrender of those Ukrainian troops to the Russians. <clears throat> this war should have ended a long time ago. We've kept it going at, at the expense of the Ukrainian people. I don't think Americans ever understood much of it or really paid much attention to it. We are very fortunate that the Russians have chosen to limit the fighting and limit the conflict to eastern Ukraine. <clears throat> there was never any intention on Russia's part to invade eastern Europe. That was all nonsense. Uh, they're not interested in it now. They would like the war to end, but the problem that we have is how do we end this thing without looking ridiculous? And I don't think uh, that's an easy question to answer. Everyone is running around in Washington and London trying to put a happy face on the dead rat. And uh, that's, that's the case with Ukraine. But the Russians have a series of demands. I'm told that they've actually sent a note uh, at our request privately through back channels. People in the White House are apoplectic. They don't know how to answer it. I mean, frankly, we no longer have a say in what happens in eastern Ukraine. Neither does NATO. NATO is in ruins. I'll be very surprised if NATO survives much longer. So the whole thing has been a catastrophe for us. We, we grossly underestimated the Russians. We did not understand them. We thought we could isolate them. We were never able to do that. And then uh, our, our proxy force did all that it could but it's very difficult to build armies from scratch in a short period of time. They really didn't have much of a chance. So it, this is over, and I think the American people are now focused on the Middle East. And this is, if you will, a new disaster unfolding, one that uh, unfortunately we've had a hand in creating. Before we jump into the Middle East, um, you know, I've seen, like I said, many of your interviews, and of course, you've been calling the this war was over a long time ago. It was probably, I think maybe you just made the comment, it was over probably before it even started. Um, a couple things, you know, I know, like, obviously, when this war started, s seemingly, uh, since the Vietnam War and all the Middle Eastern wars and kind of where we're at now, like there was no objective, like what does winning look like, right? And so when you think about it from that perspective, like what did winning look like? Uh, I don't know if that was clearly identified. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But some of the maybe winning to me looks like a few months ago, Zelensky was over here um, not just trying to get money from the political establishment, but he was in Wall Street and he got money from Blackstone and BlackRock and Bill Ackman. And it sort of looked like the country might have been demolished and sort of the people, millions of people left, tens of millions of people left. And then the country just got divided up, chopped up and sold off to Wall Street. Maybe that was mission accomplished. Any insight well, into that? Well, the Wall Street vultures have certainly swooped in and are interested in acquiring ownership as, of as much fertile land in Ukraine as they can get. Remember, this is the, the famous Black Earth. Uh, a friend of mine who lived in eastern Ukraine for a long time, he said, all you have to do is take a stick, you know, like a broomstick, stick it in the ground, and suddenly something will grow on it. I mean, you're talking about some of the most fertile ground anywhere in the planet. And this is 15, 20 feet thick on, as topsoil goes. Uh, it was so good that uh, during World War II, uh, the Germans filled boxcars or, uh, you know, uh, trains with uh, this fertile earth and brought it back to Germany. 
uh, it's, it's tragic, but yes, I think you're right. Wall Street will find a way to profit from this. I think uh, Blackstone is the tip of the proverbial, uh, you know, iceberg. How far will they get? I don't know. Uh, it's tragic. I feel terribly uh, for the Ukrainian people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, you know, JP Morgan and like I said, all these groups have pledged, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment capital. <laughs> and so when you just think through, well, investment, that means they're putting hundreds of billions in expecting some sort of a return. Uh, so uh, natural gas, you know, minerals, uh, uranium, potentially, obviously the fertile ground, all of those things seem to have been potentially sold off. And then there's going to be some big rebuilding effort. Um, and so, well, I don't know about the rebuilding effort. We're going to have to wait and see. You're talking about a lot of damage. Uh, and uh, coming up with that sort of investment means that you first and foremost have to have an agreement in place with the Russians. That means right. that whatever remains of Ukraine has to be neutral and demilitarized. Right. Uh, that's what will happen. I'm not sure what kind of a government you're going to get, but I'm sure the Russians will have someone appointed to the uh, National Security Council of that government to ensure that nothing is undertaken with the goal of harming Russia. Now, to go back to this business of what, what's the purpose, what's the objective, that's very important. Now, let's okay. just stop for a second. In the military, we usually talk about three things, purpose, method, and end state. What is the purpose of the operation? How do you oppose to exe execute the operation? In other words, what's your plan? What's your method? And then finally, end state. What do you want things to look like when it's over? We don't usually think through that on the strategic or operational levels. We never ask the question, first of all, the objective. If, you, if you're going to go into Iraq and your objective is to transform it into the first liberal dem democracy in the Middle East that will be friendly to Israel, you're inane, you're stupid. That will never happen. And that, of course, was the objective in 2003. That has failed miserably. Uh, so you have to have an attainable objective. No one has ever said, what is the attainable objective? What we said is, let's harm Russia. Right. Why? I, I haven't figured that out. I never regarded the Russians, or I shouldn't say never, but certainly have not regarded Russia since the mid-1990s as an enemy of the United States. So I was trying to figure out, what, what, is, what is this as an objective? Secondly, how do you do it? Well, we sacrifice the lives of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, we drive millions of Ukrainians out of the country and we destroy the economy and the infrastructure. So what's the end state? In other words, what do you want it to look like when it's over? Well, the Russians should be defeated. The regime should change. Putin should be gone. I mean, right. th th this is all absurd nonsense. So we have a problem. We, we don't want to think through things realistically. We see everything through this utterly absurd lens of America is the indispensable superpower. Nothing can happen without us. We are always right. Well, I think we know that's simply nonsense. And we've made a terrible mess out of Ukraine. And as I say, I think NATO is effectively in ruins. I'd be surprised that much of it survives.